deserve the emoluments. And of course, that's the other advice. The best way to get what you want in life is to deserve what you want. How could it be otherwise? It's not crazy enough so that the world is looking for a lot of undeserving people to reward. Well, and, and so you just, you keep plugging. So I wouldn't be discouraged. I told a group this morning about an example of what I call a real bad employment market. My uncle Fred graduated from the Harvard School of Architecture with great distinction. And in the 20s, he had a very successful architectural practice in Omaha where he did churches and little buildings and houses and so forth. And he made eight or $10,000 a year, which was an enormous amount of money to make from credibly performing the architectural profession in the 1920s. When the 30s came, the architectural permits, building permits in Omaha, would sometimes go down to $30,000 per month for the whole city of Omaha, and some of those were furnace repairs. There was exactly zero work for architects, including my distinguished architect, Uncle Fred. He moved to California, and in California, he took drafting work at low rates for, for a few architects that still had some work. And when it got worse than that, he went to the county of Los Angeles. In the agony of the county, they classified him as a laundryman to save money, but had him do drafting work, which after all was exercising his skill. He didn't think it was beneath him. He coped as best he could. He never complained to anybody. And his pay after deductions all through 31, 32, 33, 34, 10808 per month. Now that wasn't as bad as it seems because he rented a whole house in Glendale for $25 a month. When they created the FHA in 1936, he could take a civil service exam, in which he was first. So for the rest of his life, he was the chief architect for the FHA in Los Angeles, a responsible and interesting and and civilization benefiting line of work, and he had a long and happy career doing that. He never got discouraged. He never thought what he had to do was something he should wail about. I never heard him complain about anything. What you should do with your own life depends on your own opportunity costs, so how likely it is you're going to need the money suddenly at an inconvenient time on a lot of other subjects. Generally speaking, I would say that if in the last, look what happened in the last hundred years. Well, say the, say the 20th century, 1900 to 2000. GDP per capita, hard to measure because what's it worth to have your children live instead of die because of vaccines against diphtheria and so on and so on. I mean, the net increases in living standards and in human options between 1900 and 2000 were simply awesome. When you take the big picture view instead of the short picture view, think what came. Widely distributed electric power, television and radio, the ability to get in your own car, move around where you wanted, cheap travel by jet all over the world, air conditioning, in places that are unendurable in the summer. Widely distributed information. It's, it's just unbelievable what happened. In no previous hundred years did anything remotely comparable happen. Are all those forces gone? I don't think the next hundred years is going to do as much because those are such huge achievements given human needs. Once you got the right temperature and the right usage, you know, you're getting into frou-frou when you get into the, the improvements from that point. But, but do I think there will be more improvements and more options? Yes. Do more tragedies? Big tragedies. You know, big death rates occasionally. I, th I don't think, I think the next hundred years will be very interesting for some of you people. And, but, I just think it's a good time to be alive. I think there's a lot of good that will happen. And when you look at this enormous big picture gain in longevity and behavior, the liberty for people in the underclass, more liberty for a whole sex, half the population, it was just incredible what happened.
So I, I think to look back on that in a big picture way and be terribly discouraged is to sort of underestimate your, your species and your civilization. Even suppose there's a 25% death rate. It'll be a big deal if it affects you or your family, but apart from that, why, the Black Death was good for the survivors. <laughs> no. In other words, I, think they, I don't think it's a, a time to be at all discouraged. Your generation will be up to it. And uh, the talent that comes along, I love to tell a story about Caltech. Caltech has a Rubik's Cube contest. And one year, a guy won it. He asked for three cubes, and he juggled them like this. And as they went by in his hands while he was juggling, he solved all three. <laughs> and people thought that was a hell of an achievement that would be hard to top. And the next year, along came a slender young woman. And she said, give me two Rubik's cubes. And she just held them in front of her and looked at them for a long, long, long time. Then she put one in her left hand, one on her right, and put both hands behind her back and twiddled and took them out soft. Nobody has stopped that yet. <laughs> so there's a lot of competition in your generation, but it's only gone that far. If you can handle that much, why? Another idea that I got, and this may remind you of Confucius too, is that wisdom acquisition was a moral duty. It's not something you do just to advance in life. Wisdom acquisition is a moral duty. And there's a corollary to that proposition, which is very important. It means that you're hooked for lifetime learning. And without lifetime learning, you people are not going to do very well. You are not going to get very far in life based on what you already know. You're going to advance in life by what you're going to learn after you leave here. If you take Berkshire Hathaway, which is certainly one of the best regarded corporations in the world, and it may have the best long-term investment record in the entire history of civilization. The skill that got Berkshire through one decade would not have sufficed to get it through the next decade with the achievements made. Without Warren Buffett being a learning machine, a continuous learning machine, the record would have been absolutely impossible. The same is true at lower walks of life. I constantly see people rise in life who were not the smartest, sometimes not even the most diligent, but they are learning machines. They go to bed every night a little wiser than they were when they got up. And boy, does that habit help, particularly when you have a long run ahead of you. In my generation, who were the nerds who were patient and rational eventually did well, who lived within their income and, and worked at being sensible and, and when they saw an opportunity, grabbed it pretty fiercely and so forth. And I think that will work for the new nerds of the world. And the people who get ahead because they're star salesmen or charismatic personalities, I'm not one of those, so I don't know how to do that. So if you're not a nerd, I can't help you. And, and I think that the odds are that most people who try to do finance are not gonna succeed. And, and there's a lot of wretched excess in it because easy money will always attract wretched excess. It's just the nature, it's like a bunch of animals feeding on a carcass in Africa. By the way, that's an image I chose on purpose. And, but no, no, so I don't think it's so pretty. And I don't think that modern finance is so wonderful. And in my day, a lot of the finance people were more like engineers. They were so chastened by the Great Depression and all the wretched failure that they really tried to make everything super safe. And it was a very different plodding place that just tried, the people weren't trying to get rich, they were trying to be safe. This modern world is radically different. And, and I'm not sure if I were starting out a new world, in your world, how well I would do.
it would be a lot harder than it was to get ahead in the world the way it was when I came up. How are you? My best advance. I think you'll be happier if you reduce your expectations than if you try and satisfy them. And by the way, I think that's generally a very good idea.